The next paper is entitled Cervical Spine Clearance in the Traumatically Injured Patient. Is CT scan sufficient alone? Authors Quigley, Chu, and Swartz. The discussion will be Dr. Hadley. Good morning, everyone. Um, just want to acknowledge my uh, co authors, uh, Dr. Chu and Schwartz. These are only disclosures. So, uh, a number of you folks in the room, I'm sure, are old enough to remember being called down to the emergency room, um, typically at 2 in the morning, to uh, clear a, a cervical spine in a patient, uh, perhaps following a motor vehicle accident. And the, the folks in the ER simply showed you this picture. And during your training, you would have immediately thought, okay, I need to see all seven vertebrae. But the normal bone anatomy and alignment wasn't sufficient to clear the spine because uh, you needed an awake cooperative patient. So the question becomes in modern day, does the concern over ligamentous injury anachronistic in a time of multi-detector CT of the spine? In other words, were the concerns and uh, the ethos present at the time when we got this picture are they still operant uh, today when we're typically going to be handed this picture? Um, the response to this question has been to add more technology, that is to get an MRI. But obviously the concerns about MRI, they're expensive. There's a lot of false positives. Uh, there's the risk to the patient in transport and within the magnet. I would imagine at most of your institutions there's one or two folks who arrest uh, on the way or back from uh, their studies every year. And obviously, the MR is not compatible with metal implants. About five years ago, uh, I started looking at this. And uh, we looked at our patient population at the time of about 6,500 trauma patients and found that there were nine who were originally not identified as having uh, a fracture who ultimately underwent some kind of intervention. Uh, but um, it turned out that with the benefit of hindsight, a CT identified all the patients who were potentially a problem. Another one of my co-authors, Dr. Chu, across the river at uh, the University of Pittsburgh also started looking at this uh, same topic and in a little bit of a different way. And they looked at uh, obtunded or comatose patients, a much smaller population, obviously. And they found that 38 uh, uh, or 21 percent had some findings on MR and that uh, 16 out of this group which, as you can see, is a little bit less than 10 percent of the original group had ligamentous injury. But they didn't consider this unstable because none of these uh, ligamentous injuries were three column. And they concluded their paper with the quote that a retrospective review of the electronic medical records revealed none of these 180 patients developed evidence delayed cervical instability required surgery for C-spine injury. And that's going to come back to sort of haunt a lot of these studies, is that the follow-up on all of the patients in order to get a conclusive um, conclusion is very difficult. Um, this uh, debate was further advanced about a year ago when this paper appeared in the Journal of Neurosurgery, which was a huge meta-analysis of over 14,000 obtunded patients, from which they concluded that modern CT alone is sufficient to detect an unstable cervical spine injury in a trauma patient, even those who are comatose or uncooperative, and that an MR scan is simply not necessary. Well, as you might imagine, this was not necessarily taken as accepted wisdom. There was a lot of controversy in regard to the interpretation of the data, one of which was the absence of any uh, gold standard comparator, that is an MR. So around the same time, we had started looking at our own um, patient population, which was a, a very large uh, trauma uh, a database from a trauma registry. So we looked at all of our admissions for which we had uh, radiographic uh, computerized uh, returns, so from January on to uh, January of 2011. We looked at the report of the uh, CT by a board-certified uh, neuroradiologist, if that were normal. We also uh, looked to see that the patient had a subsequent MR performed during that admission. Uh, we identified over 1,000 patients. The mechanism of falls, as you can see there, pretty typical. The mean time to MR was about two days, although the median ranged out pretty far. And the indications, as you can see there, were about half and half pain neurologic findings versus altered mental status and the inability to the, the thought that it was a, we were unable to clear the spine. 
So out of this group, 39 underwent some type of cervical, uh, cervical surgical procedure for either central cord discogenic quadriparesis or discogenic pain. Uh, no surgical patient had an unstable spine, and here are some typical pictures of folks who underwent operations. This is a uh, middle-aged man who came in quadriparetic uh, from that uh, devastating injury at 3-4. Uh, this is a fellow, an elderly, elderly gentleman who came in with a central cord syndrome who underwent a delayed operation with a decompressive cervical lamy. And this a younger woman who came in with a ridiculous, ridiculous complaints on the right-hand side who, who actually underwent a discectomy uh, approximately six or eight weeks later. So if we exclude those 39 surgical patients, the results of the MR were normal in 645, nonspecific in 195. And cutting to the quick, 125 had ligamentous injury. Uh, and of this group, uh, about 15% were comatose. So this is uh, some pictures of an elderly uh, woman with a pretty uh, concerning-looking distraction there uh, posteriorly, confirmed on MR as having extensive uh, ligamentous injury, both anteriorly and posteriorly. She had um, normal flexion extension views about six weeks later and, and had no untoward event. Similarly, this gentleman came in with uh, anterior ligamentous disruption, no evidence of fracture, flexion extension views, unremarkable, and he went on to make an uneventful recovery. So out of the 125 patients who were able to track down a total of uh, 75, the red you see there are the up-to-date numbers which we were able to obtain uh, between the submission of this uh, abstract and then the presentation. Um, all non-cleared patients, that is those 50 patients, were discharged home in a collar with instructions to follow up with their spine surgeon, usually in two to four weeks with flexion extension views. And there was no record of any of these referred patients requiring any further treatment of a cervical spine problem. Um, so in conclusion, uh, ligamentous injury in the setting of a normal CT spine is actually common in our population, about 12%. In the uh, other studies, it's around 10 to 15 percent. Um, in our experience, none of these patients required any further intervention. Um, and the MR was useful um, solely to guide the surgical procedures, which were already determined by clinical presentation. So uh, this is the largest series of traumatic patients with a normal cervical CT who had a subsequent MR performed. Uh, obviously, the shortcomings of this study is that we were, were not able to, to obtain follow-up on all the patients. However, I would submit to you that this is a common drawback of the uh, so-called ambulatory trauma populations, is that these are not the most reliable patients, and it is very difficult to obtain follow-up in 100 percent. So what I, would, what I would submit to you today is that uh, this is uh, fundamentally a, a black swan problem, uh, not re referring to the recent movie with Natalie Portman, but rather a book by N Nassim Taleb. Um, and the Black Swan deals with um, how to deal with unpredictable or very unlikely events. And the fundamental difficulty is that there are no number of white swan sightings which can disprove the existence of a black swan. So no number of patients with ligamentous injuries on their MR. Uh, who subsequently turn out to not require an intervention can prove in future that every patient will not require any intervention. And the statistics, our statistics can only give us confidence intervals, and those confidence intervals may include zero, but will never be zero alone. So it really becomes the role of the, the specialty and the societies to establish appropriate guidelines and therefore uh, thresholds of behavior in terms of what are appropriate tests uh, to intervene with. Thank you very much. Right. Good morning. Thank you uh, to the Scientific Program Committee to, uh, for allowing me to participate. What a remarkable morning, what a terrific meeting, and what a great year of leadership uh, by uh, our President Paul McCormick. Congratulations to the uh, AANS. So cervical spine clearance. Uh, um, Matt uh, Quigley and his group have spent a great deal of time and many, many years uh, studying these issues. I'm happy to make a few comments. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief. How do I go forward? Left. Okay. 
Here's the study. You just heard uh, Matt's uh, uh, eloquent uh, presentation. Um, 1,004 blunt trauma victims, CT imaging and MR imaging uh, within 2.1 days. Of course, there's a, a range there. The results, well, uh, there no mention of the number of positive CT studies. Normal MR, 645 patients, so 64% degenerative changes on MR. You, see, you saw his breakdown. Uh, ligamentous injury presumed but not proven on MR, about 12%. So as we go through the data, if we look at the medical evidence provided and use the appropriate calculations, we can't perform a comparison between the CT imaging and the MR imaging from the data provided. We're unable to perform a Bayesian analysis and therefore can't determine the sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive values for MR or accuracy from this particular study, at least in the information provided me. They concluded MR frequently detects injuries not identified on CT and no ligamentous injury on MR was found to be unstable. Therefore, in their study, MR did not add additional information. Final conclusion, CT with reconstructions sufficient for cervical spine clearance from their study. And this provides class three medical evidence. Our group, this remarkable author group, spent the last 18 months re-updating uh, uh, the previous iteration of these guidelines performed in 2002. Uh, I'll give you the brief, the recommendations from the, uh, from the uh, uh, chapter on radiographic assessment. So in awake patients, you need no imaging if they are truly asymptomatic. In awake symptomatic patients, CT imaging. Countless numbers of class one medical evidence studies prove that CT imaging is sufficient uh, to uh, assess uh, for injury of all types. If high quality CT imaging is unavailable, routine three dimension or routine cervical spine films are uh, recommended based on earlier class one medical evidence. Here's the issue. Two important points. In the obtunded or unavailable patient, those are really the dilemmas we face. CT imaging is recommended as the imaging study of choice. Class one medical evidence, make the, uh, very strong uh, uh, medical evidence that this is indeed all you need. With the addition that there's important class two medical evidence that uh, we need a specialist. That's where we are involved. We need to interpret those studies. Uh, we need to evaluate those patients and interpret those studies. Uh, so it's recommended that the decisions for further patient care, including the interpretation of those CT images in the obtunded or unavailable patient, uh, be um, uh, trained in the diagnosis and management of these injuries. There's other class three medical evidence, but for MR's purposes, you can discontinue cervical mobilization following a normal MR study obtained within 48 hours of in, uh, injury. But again, there is conflicting and limited class two and class three medical evidence on this subject uh, thus far with respect to MR and its ability to predict uh, a meaningful injury. Congratulations to the authors on a, on a terrific study. Thank you.